We are speaking to the CEO of Silver One Resources, which is one of my personal favorite holdings in the Silver Junior space. I was originally introduced to the company and was told, you need to buy this company by Keith Newmeyer, the CEO of First Majestic Silver, whom everyone knows, one of the most respected guys in the silver industry. And so today we're speaking with Greg, the CEO of Silver One Resources, which trades in Canada, and you can get access to it on the OTC over here in America, where we are. So i um, excited to talk about silver, talk to a real executive that has you know some fantastic insights into what's going on in the silver market and where it might be going in the future. So be sure to check out Silver One Resources and make sure you hit the like button on the left side right over there, the right side. Let's send this out to more people and give us your silver price predictions in the comments right there down below for 2021. Give us your silver price predictions. And you know, I'm going to be asking you that a little bit. Greg, how you doing? Good, good. How are you doing there, Jake? Doing good. I got no complaints. You know, like I told you, I'm in my Hawaiian gear and you're in your snow gear. <laughs> Not quite yet. Maybe tonight. Yeah. It's going to drop down these temperatures in the far north. What can we say? Okay. So um, obviously, you know, you're a guy that knows a lot about the precious metals market. I mean, the as Keith and I started talking more, the first, you know, the Keith Newmeyer just said, buy this stock. I said, okay, fine, I'll buy it. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, been really impressed with everything you guys got going on, but you're in Vancouver, you know, you're, you're at the epicenter of all the commodities and precious metals companies. So you got to tell me, first of all, why did you choose to go into the silver industry with Silver One Resources as opposed to gold? Like gold's a no-brainer. Everyone says, oh, it's going to such a high price. Tell me what it was about silver that made you want to enter that market. Okay. Well, first of all, Jake, I might have a year or two on you. And <laughs> um, I, uh, I've been around the bush a little bit. My previous company was a copper gold company, actually, uh, focusing in jurisdictions like Mongolia. But um, one thing you did say was, um, you know, you mentioned the name Keith Newmeyer, who runs a company called First Majestic with Operating Mines in Mexico, very successful fellow. And um, he kind of uh, convinced me to uh, come out of retirement, which I did in uh, 2015. <laughs> 15 and maybe head up a silver company. So that was very good. But the opportunity was there as well. Not only um, does Silver One have some pretty exciting uh, projects uh, that we're currently uh, working on, but um, silver is a very important uh, commodity uh, with respect to um, our everyday life. And uh, the projections for silver are very, very promising. Uh, uses are increasing uh, on a long term uh, basis. People are starting to predict a bull market in silver. I think we've seen that beginning here in the last few months. Goldman uh, themselves are calling for a 10 plus year boom in uh, precious metals and silver tends to, shall we say, outperform gold on a percentage basis during a bull market. And we've seen that in a lot of the historic uh, aspects of bull markets. And, uh, you know, um, I think we've got some pretty savvy investors in our company, not only yourself, but we've got Keith Newmeyer, we've got Eric Sprott, who is uh, Canada's equivalent of Warren Buffett in the mining <laughs> business, and he's essentially come into our stock in three separate private placements. So I think um, you know their success speaks for themselves, and um, they've got a lot of confidence in Silver One. So. That's why I decided, well, why not come out of retirement and run a silver company? So then are you in the camp where you believe that the silver juniors such as such as yours, but also just the price of physical silver, you believe that that has far potential for outperformance as opposed to, say, a gold uh, bullion, gold spot price, gold stocks? you're in the camp of, of, of thinking that we got a lot more room to run in silver. 
Yeah, I do. As I said, you know, silver tends to outperform gold on a percentage basis during these bull markets. And, uh, um, you know, if we look at uh, what's the price of gold right now, you know, eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars per ounce. Well, the historic high of gold was just under two thousand dollars per ounce. Silver is essentially sitting right now at about twenty five to twenty seven dollars, twenty eight dollars per ounce. And uh, the historic highs of silver was just shy of 50. So uh, uh, place your bets. Where do you think the biggest gain might come from? You know, and you can look at the uh, what a lot of people talk about is the gold silver ratio. And essentially all that says is how many ounces of silver do I need to buy one ounce of gold? Historically, very low, 15 to 20. But after the US went off the gold standard in the early 70s, it fluctuated up and down. In March of 2020 with COVID, it was at 126. It would cost you 126 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. Today, it's fallen down as we enter into this bull market to 65 to 70 to one. So that's quite an increase in silver with respect to the value of gold. Where do you think it could go, the gold to silver ratio? Well, last time we saw these types of moves in silver, uh, 2011, 2012, which was in the commodities boom post the 2008 uh, recession, shall we say, and uh, people were protecting all sorts of uh, great growth, etc. And um, what we did was we saw it go down as low as 35 to 1. So you think we could see that again? I think so. I think um, essentially what's happening in the world today makes the uh, post-2008 stimulus packages and uh, other means and methods of, uh, of trying to uh, crawl out of a recession pale in comparison to what we may be looking forward to. Yeah, that's what I think. All right. So, you know, there's all there's all types of of silver stocks and gold stocks and precious metals related equities. So for someone who's, you know, you, you guys have flown under the radar still quite a bit for, you know, having, uh, you know, a great team and, and, and great resource base. But tell me why Silver One Resources, for someone who hasn't heard of it or isn't an investor in it, tell me why it's a special mining stock compared to other silver related equities. Yeah, well, I'll try and be subjective here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll try and be objective even. But uh, what can I say? You know, um, Silver One, our mantra is let's build a real silver company. In times of bull markets, you're seeing a lot of companies kind of come out of the woodwork, and a lot of them might be what we refer to as one hole wonders or just bull market opportunities, and um, they're short term. Uh, but we're growing a real silver company. I think that's why people like Keith Newmeyer, like Eric Sprott, like our company is because we're putting quality assets with potential long term growth. What we're doing is it takes time to develop. That's why uh, perhaps we've been under the radar for you know a couple of years. Plus, silver prices didn't exactly perform between 2017 and 2019 before silver prices kicking up. Now we're getting quite a good reputation. We've got quite a good following and we've got lots of good quality investors in our company. So, um, you know, I think uh, that makes Silver One an extremely interesting company. Plus, we have the management team to help us out, and we've got those investors backing us as well. So, you know, one of the things I have to ask you, so when I would imagine as a, as a silver executive, when Eric Sprott gets involved, you know, in a big way, it's, you know, it's, it's always pretty exciting. What was that like? You know, I think that I saw he invested, I think like 17%. Uh, what was that like? And I know he's a huge silver bull more than more than gold. So I imagine that was pretty exciting. Yeah, if you want to look at uh, just go on some of the stock chart history with respect to Silver One, and if you look at, uh, you know, how did our stock perform the first time that Eric Sprott invested in our company, that would have been in July of 2019, you'll see that our stock went up 
uh, quite, uh, it had a, quite a significant rise, okay? And then, of course, uh, in July of 2020, which was the third time he invested in our company, um, he put in $5 million of a $9.5 million financing in July of 2020. We had a, a similar response with respect to a very positive move on our stock. So, so tell me, are you say we're building a real silver company? And, and as I've got to know Keith more and more, I mean, that was you know, from a mentorship perspective, he said, look, you know, a lot of these companies are, they're going to pop up during the bull market. They have no intention of developing anything and they're just selling, they're mining shares. They're not mining silver and they have no plans. So tell me what your big goals are um, with Silver One. You say, you know, we're building a a real silver company. So tell me your goals. Okay. Well, um, you know, I guess the ultimate goal is can you know can we get into production and be a profitable cash flowing company you know that's the ultimate goal it takes time it takes energy um it takes a lot of initial seed investment etc because silver like any other commodity is difficult to find and it's getting harder and harder to find and it's getting more and more costly to find we've managed to find 3 quality silver projects in the southwest U.S. One is a past producing silver mine that was one of the richest silver mines in the state of Nevada, produced just under 70 million ounces of silver. The latest producer was Kinross Gold back in the late 1990s. And the only reason they shut it down would be, was because in 97, the silver prices collapsed well under $5 per ounce silver. They passed it off to a company called Silver Standard that moved along. Um, they brought in some other assets that they focused on, and then they turned into a gold producing company. And we happened to acquire it from Silver Standard at a very, very good price, shall we say. On top of that, we got two other opportunities, very high-grade exploration opportunities. One of them has returned an unprecedented 459,000 gram per ton sample. Now, what does that mean in terms of layman's language? Well, that's about 14,500 ounces per ton. Uh, Per ton of rock is uh, essentially three feet by three feet by three feet. So you can imagine what that looks like. And then on top of that, most active mines producing from underground mining, which is some of the most expensive methods of mining, are producing only at somewhere between 200 and 700 grams per ton silver. And 700 grams per ton silver is considered very high. That's what a lot of the mines are producing. Here we have surface samples. We haven't found the source of it yet, but 459,000 grams per ton silver. So good opportunity. So slowly we're building. If we can find these resources, then we hope to move towards a production uh, situation. So um, you said a moment ago, silver is getting harder and harder to find. And, you know, a lot of people say that, and it's almost always, if you're, if you're a layman, you may even feel like, oh, it's just a marketing angle. But the fact is, there's just not new silver mines coming online. And so my question to you with regards to what you just said is, what's the long-term price forecast that you personally feel for silver? And does the fact you know, we're seeing all this conversation about silver short squeeze and all these bullion dealers. I mean, at least in America, I mean, even big companies like uh, uh, Apex don't ha- don't have any silver right now for people to buy. Yep. So, do, do you see this decrease in mine having a having a pr- having effect on the price of silver? And where do you think the price can go? Yeah, it's a. Uh... It's a long, complicated answer. I'll try and shorten it as much as I can. I'm just going to talk about a little bit about supply and demand, and then I'll talk about where I might think silver prices uh, might be going. Um, so first of all, supply and demand. When I say silver mines are hard to come by, there are very, very few pure silver mines in the world. They just aren't. Silver is a byproduct of a lot of other mines. Lead, zinc, copper, even gold mines produce silver but there's very few pure silver mines. First Majestic, which is one of the pure silver companies in the world, only derives about 60 to 65% of its revenue from silver. It produces the rest from lead, zinc, gold, etc. So it's also harder and harder to find mines. A lot of the near surface easy ones have been picked over. The other complicating factor 
with respect to finding mines. What are the big mining jurisdictions in the world for silver? We're looking at Mexico, we're looking at Peru, we're looking at China. Not exactly easy jurisdictions always to work in. Mexico is probably the best one of those three. But jurisdiction is a very important. The safe jurisdictions, some of them have very strict environmental policies, which make it a little bit more costly to put a mine into production. Last year's supply of mined silver dropped by about 7% in comparison to 19, uh, sorry, uh, 2019. And it's been in decline for the last few years. And yet demand has remained high and is continued and forecast to grow, particularly with the electronic revolution, which is coming because silver is used extensively in the electric electrics market, shall we say. We can talk about that. So where do I think silver is going? Well, first of all, um, we talked about what were the highs of silver, you know, $40, $50. Um, I think it's very reasonable to assume that silver prices will probably go up over $30 in 2021. And as the bull market continues and economic growth returns in a post COVID world, because 60 to 70% of the usage of silver, unlike gold, is in the industrial uh, area, then I think that climbing up to $40, $50 is not unreasonable to expect. And if you look historically, one thing that's really interesting, I mean, historically, silver has traded under $5 per ounce on an average basis up until the time around when the U.S. went off the gold standard in the early 1970s. And then it traded between $5 and $10 for a while. And then post-COVID, it was between uh, $10 and $18. Those were base prices. Now we're seeing prices in the mid-20s. Is that the new base price for silver? And maybe it'll be 30 next year. We'll see. So let's talk about that because that's a that's an interesting component. You said about 70% or so of silver is for industry, right? In America, we got the Democrats now control and you know all, all branches of government. Biden said, you know, he wants to stick um, electrical vehicle chargers everywhere in your house, like their toilets. And it'll be all over the place. And so, and then there's also, of course, the solar and, and, and the whole renewable push that, you know, is, is very alive and well and is only going to continue. Then you have China that obviously has such bad air pollution. So they're going to have to, you know, incorporate more renewables. What do you expect um, from this EV renewable push into into uh, the the mainstream and how you anticipate that affecting silver because if it's a big push and all of a sudden it goes from seventy to eighty percent wow retail demand is going up too it seems like that could put a big squeeze on things yeah sure so um, I mean when silver prices were low. And we were kind of in a bit of a quandary with respect to, you know, are we going to grow the economy or not? You know, silver actually, the industrial side actually consumed up to about uh, 70 to 80 percent of all the uses of silver. Lately, with the retail demand, that's jumped from 20 percent up to 30, 35 percent, even up to 40 percent. So if moving forward, we see an increase in the industrial demand as well as the retail demand, then you're going to see a real push on silver prices. And that's in the positive sense. Now, with respect to all of these economies, the industrial commodities of the world, I'm going to count China in that industrial commodities of the world as well. Huge demand is going to come, particularly with the so-called green revolution. Uh, you know, this is not a new thing with respect to Biden. The green revolution has been building and building and building for the last few decades. But it really, uh, you know, came to a head, shall we say, under the previous U.S. Um, um, Uh, administration uh, that kind of put a kibosh on that and a pause and then COVID hit. But post-COVID, 
if we have a return to industrialization, to a positive economy, you're going to see all sorts of demand because silver is used in every single electric component you can think of. It's in your cell phone. It's in your computer. It's used in solar panels. It's used in electric vehicles. It's used in fridges. It's used in air conditioners. You name it. Silver is a vital component with respect to electrical conductivity because silver has one of the highest uh, conductivity uh, uh, of any other element on this planet. And it's a lot cheaper than gold. Maybe gold's the nearest comparable. You know, copper is also another important component with respect to the green uh, uh, revolution as well. But silver is extremely important. And as I said, those silver mines are getting harder and more expensive to find. Do you think that whether it's a whether it's an Elon Musk, whether it's the CEO of of um, of Samsung or I don't know what other all the big electronic companies. Do you, and, and and the big players in the renewable movement, right? Everything from batteries to solar panels to everyday electronics. Do you think they are keeping track closely of this whole conversation of the silver short squeeze and and the fact that retail demand's going up, um, which could could pinch on that? I think it's 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 not even debatable that we're going to see a huge push in in renewables um, now that. You know, now that uh, we've got, you know, the Biden administration, as you said, back in the throttle, that's going to that's going to happen. So do you think that this is a conversation happening behind the scenes yet in this type of silver users association and such? Sure. Sure. Um, I think uh, it's there and people are talking about it. A lot of the industrial, uh, shall we say, users of silver. I mean, there's all sorts of conspiracy theories out there that they're trying to control the silver market, keep prices low because uh, they don't want to pay more for uh, silver usage. But it's going to break out, you know, as supplies, um, you know, uh, uh, take hold, then the supply demand situation might actually override if the conspirators are correct, this uh, push to keep silver prices down. And we've seen it happen before in the past. And I think we're starting to see it again with silver going from, uh, what was it, $15 uh, just a couple of years ago, up to now $25, $30 range. And uh, probably a push to go higher with more industrial usage. So yes, I think they're talking about it. Uh, they're not publicly talking about it that much, but I think the uh, Reddit Robinhood push on silver uh, just over a week ago has certainly uh, caught their attention as well as a lot of young new investors in the United States uh, that silver is an important commodity. Um, we see most of the talk around things like cobalt, nickel, which is all centered around battery use, but you, um, if you're Elon Musk and you're thinking, how much silver do I need to build one electric car? Then, um, you know, I don't want to see the price of silver go up too high. So yeah, they're talking about it. Okay. So let me ask you then, because one of the interesting types of things that I think through on that and talking to Keith as well, you know, he, he thinks eventually maybe they'll even start buying mines, especially if the retail demand can go from 30 to 40, 45 to 50. What is the price effect if we have a, a, a push in the economy that goes very strong into EVs and very strong into renewables? And, you know, we see it, we see an increase in 2021 of the amount of silver that a substantial increase in the amount of silver that's used on an annualized basis in, in industry. Um, what are the results of that? If we, we're having a decrease in mines, you said uh, about a 7% decrease in the amount of silver uh, in, 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 in 2020, what happens in a, in a, in a game like that? price goes up, period, full <laughs> stop. <laughs> and if the price goes up in the physical metal, um, what goes up with respect to silver companies? Because they often trade at a premium to the increase in the price in the metal itself. And that's true in almost any commodity. What is that premium? Depends on the quality of the company and uh, uh, you know where you're at with respect to a potential production situation. That's why Silver One is moving as fast as we can with respect to our expiration and uh, potentially moving towards a production situation. So um, yeah, and 
could these groups come in and start buying mines? Well, didn't we see uh, Mr. Uh, Musk talk about uh, nickel, uh, environmentally friendly ways of mining nickel and investing in those types of companies? So um, it's probably, you know, we're not there yet, but it could be coming. Interesting. So um, then what do you think Silver's an interesting conversation because a lot of people just chalk it up as poor man's gold. And the yep. reason that got me very interested in it is because, I mean, when you really look at the math and 70 whatever percent is used in industry, I mean, it presents a, a pretty unique opportunity that as a precious metal that gold doesn't present. But what do you think people don't understand about the silver market that you think makes it a compelling investment thesis? Sure. Um, well, one thing uh, that I did hear I thought was quite interesting is people talk about uh, silver being the poor man's gold. Well, I heard the uh, flip side of that. And uh, what's interesting is copper is a uh, very highly conductive element as well, used in a lot of uh, wiring for our homes and uh, used in all the cell phones, etc. And people have referred to silver as being the rich man's copper not the poor man's gold. So um, I found that one I interesting. I would like to think of silver as being perhaps the wise man's gold because um, <laughs> essentially, you know, if you want to go out and you want to pay uh, $2,000 for an ounce of gold, um, it, whereas you can go out and pay $25 for an ounce of silver, um, uh, I'd prefer to have a lot more silver. Um, because, you know, if a crisis ever came, uh, silver would be much more easier to go out and buy a loaf of bread with than an ounce of gold, shall we say. So um, I like silver, and I think uh, people do move into silver in terms of the bull market. We've seen the retail push already underway, and that's pushed the price of silver, as I said, from $15 up to $25. And I think a lot of people don't really understand that about silver. You know, I've heard people tell me that silver is a bad investment. Well, I can think of any Thing that's a bad investment. Um, you know, do you want to go out and buy Tesla at uh, $800 per share? Um, is that a bad investment? Not necessarily, but when you consider that something like Tesla is currently trading at 200 times uh, valuation over GM or Ford or Toyota, and all of those companies make 10 to 20 times the number of vehicles than Tesla. Is Tesla a good investment at eight hundred dollars an ounce? I don't know, but um, you know, I think there's a lot of room for moving up for silver. So, what do you think the catalyst to move it up is? It going to have to come purely from the monetary fear and retail investors? Is it going to be a combination between industrial? What do you think are the factors to to, to drive it higher? Okay, well, let's say that. Um, these COVID vaccines are going to work. And there's some questions around that because there's a few things called mutant viruses, et cetera. But let's say they do work. Then essentially what you're going to see is all of these stimulus dollars that have pushed the U.S. debt from about 20 trillion federally, we won't talk about the states or personal debt, 20 trillion dollars federally at the beginning of the Trump uh, entering the White House in 2016 to about 27 to 28 trillion today. Uh, Forbes had an article out uh, last year that suggested it may go to 80 trillion dollars within the next eight years. That was in Forbes in August uh, uh, last year. You look at those types of figures and you go, that's a lot of US dollars out there. And uh, what that does is it devalues the worth of each and every dollar. The world is already starting to question the value of the US dollar as the world reserve currency. Look at Bitcoin, what it's doing. And if there is a crisis that comes, markets crash, and there's markets always crash, what goes up will come down. And uh, if there is a return, let's say, to a post-COVID move in the improvement of the economy, a reindustrialization, shall we say, then you're going to see an increase 
probably her horrific increase in inflation as well. What are the best bets to have in your portfolio if these scenarios come to pass? You want some hard assets in there like silver, maybe a little gold, but I prefer silver because I'm so, a poor man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. So uh, <laughs> let me ask you, um, on that subject, what do you think is the um, – what is the way out of this, right? Like what – the reason that got me interested in, in silver and, and, and gold and ultimately into other commodities was really birthed out of my concerns for the future. And what do you think is the way out of this, right? Like everyone seems to think at some point um, we're going to have uh, – more and more of a loss in confidence in fiat currencies, and you know, we will have more and more inflation. How is this fixed? Do you think that they're eventually going? They're going to ride it to the wheels fall off, and then introduce a new system, or how do you get out of this type of situation where obviously the U.S. is leading the way in, in a lot of these money printings? But you know, you had um, the Bank of England say they're giving banks six months to prepare for negative rates, and it seems like this is a global phenomena that is isn't going to stop. So where do you see this going and, and what are, what are the ways that you, what do you think the future looks like? Yeah, well, you know, um, I'm not a futurist, shall we say, but I do believe in the future and I believe in the ingenuity of, uh, of uh, people, shall we say. And in particular, I believe in the ingenuity of, uh, shall we say, properly run countries. And I count the U.S. as being one of those properly run countries. It's ups and downs, shall we say. But overall, you've got a market driven economy. You have the rule of law. And I think that a lot of positive things are there with your respect to the future. Now, what does that mean um, uh, going forward for how do we get out of these situations? Well, we always get out of these situations. You look at every single major catastrophe that has befell uh, the world, uh, you know, for the last several hundred years, we've always come out on the other side. A little bit scarred sometimes, but we always come out on the other side. So interesting comparison just economically might be what was happening yeah i don't think you were around here but what was happening in the united states in the 1970s the 1970s essentially japan was going to surpass the us as the world's premier economy big companies toyota sony samsung or not samsung that's a, that's a korean but all these companies were outperforming a lot of the us companies and then we saw something in the 80s and 90s, the tech revolution came. We saw essentially the U.S. inflate its way out of its horrendous debt situation, and everything came out rosy until the tech burst, bubble burst in 2000. But then everything came out rosy again. It's going to happen again. But what's going to happen in the meantime? I think we've got, and I think the Goldman people are pretty smart people. Do we have a 10-year period where there's going to be a little bit of roughness there? How long is it going to take for full employment to return uh, post-COVID crisis? I mean, it took, uh, you know, a couple, two, three years post-2008 um, uh, post before we started seeing employment started to kick up. It really kicked up under Trump with respect to his uh, legislation that he passed with respect to deregulation and uh, decreasing taxes. And that really gave a kickstart to the economy. So it's gonna take some innovative thinking, but we have to get over this COVID crisis first. And there may be another couple of years to go through, but then there's going to be a post COVID that could be maybe a stagflation period followed by an inflation period, but all that's good for commodities, good for silver, particularly if we have a return and a strong growth to the economy. Okay. So let's talk that, right? Let's, uh, let's say we have this type of inflation scenario. Ultimately, you know, maybe there's some spikes in, in the dollar and such along the way, but long-term, so, you know, we see the silver price move in. So give me your expectations and goals with silver one in 2021 and throughout. Give us your give us your big picture over the next few years. But let's start here with your expectations and goals for 2021 with silver one resources. 
Yeah. Okay. So I told you about our three assets in the U.S. We sold off our Mexican silver assets. The big project that we're working on, the past producing Candelaria silver mine, which produced about 70 million ounces already. Um, There's some resources there that we're looking at bringing back into production. We're doing our work right now. We've got drills on the property. We're going to be doing what's called metallurgical work to see what's the best economic way of recovering the silver that was left behind by the other producers when they abandoned the property. That's a big component for us. The other two projects, very, very highly prospective, high-grade opportunities. We're going to be drilling those those, uh, properties in uh, 2021. And uh, any success that we have, I think, will be very positive for our shareholders. And on top of that, um, because of our situation, um, we're financed. Uh, We've got more than enough cash in our treasury to meet all of our 2021 and possibly 2022 goals. We don't have to go back to the markets, but we're being approached by a lot of companies with some very interesting opportunities that might, uh, if things work out, be a faster track to a production scenario than um, than even our uh, Candelaria project in Nevada. So I think the future is bright for Silver One. And as I said, we're building a silver company. We're not uh, just a one-hole wonder. Okay, so let me ask you, um, do you anticipate, you know, uh, obviously – you know, you're for real and you built a, you know, big successful company and and golden copper and retired. And, you know, Keith obviously, you know, is kind of the king of silver and he's also the king of silver on Twitter memes as well. But um, (laughs) let me ask you, when you say that we're building a silver company, do you anticipate um, just focusing on what you have or do you anticipate as things get moving more and while prices are, are in, in silver aren't astronomical yet, do you think you'll make any other moves or do you think you guys got with what you guys have focusing on developing those and, and turn that into uh, a mine? I don't believe in stagnation. I never have. So I never sit still either. Um, and um, if an opportunity prevails itself, that is going to advance the company, advance the shareholders, I'll move on it. And um, as I said, we're being approached by some groups right now that have some interesting ideas. We're looking at some of those interesting ideas. But in the meantime, we're not going to abandon the three properties we already have. We're going to keep pushing those forward. Um, Time will tell what opportunity comes to us. And um, all I can say, that's what's interesting and exciting about this industry. You don't just sit there and do nothing. Once you've achieved a certain level, you well, especially have to move with silver and grow. You love silver, but gold, any other commodity as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just find it so exciting because of you know the the uh, the industrial component. So let me ask you a little bit. You know, we we've, we've discussed kind of your 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 macro view, the needs of silver. We've discussed silver one resources. Uh, let me know a little bit more uh, about you as well. So. When was it? How big was the company you grew? When was it that that you that you sold it, and um, and and how did you grow it to, you know, such a uh, successful company? You mean my previous company that I worked with? Okay, uh, the company was called Entree Gold. And it was an opportunity that uh, came in. Um, just to put it in context uh, for your viewers, um, you know, I'm a little over 20 years old, and um, <laughs> I have, uh, you know, had a, a a long experience in the mining world, 30 plus years behind me, and um, started out with major and junior companies. But I, I came into an opportunity in 2002 to head up a company that um, uh, called Entree Gold that had the ability to acquire a large ground position around what was then called the Ivanhoe Mines Oyu Tolgoi project in Mongolia. And we picked up a package of ground that completely surrounding them. Those of you who aren't familiar with Ivanhoe Mines and Oyu Tolgoi, it was run by a fellow by the name of Robert Friedland, who is probably one of the best mining promoters in the world, period, full stop. And... Um, uh, as he developed his property, it became apparent that his mineralization was going to spill over onto our property. We ended up doing a deal with him. And then later, we brought Rio Tinto, the second largest mining company 
into Entree as its major shareholder. Within uh, several months, Rio took a position in Ivanhoe and eventually took over Ivanhoe. Entree is still in existence, but my job was kind of done in about 2015. And uh, Entree is still there holding about a 20% carried interest in some of the richest mineralization in Mongolia. So I left in 2015 and then in 2016, um, uh, I had a little chat with Keith and um, here I am sitting on a uh, running a silver company. All right. So a couple more questions. Let me ask you, um, are you in the camp, both obviously two of your major shareholders being Keith and, and Eric are both in the camp where they believe we're going to see triple digit silver. They believe silver is going to be over a hundred dollars. And, and, and Keith, you know, details that with, with, uh, with, uh, with, with respect to his thesis. Do you believe that if the, if the EV movement, if the renewable movement continues and, you know, there's also this, this retail demand picking up, do you believe that that's something we could see later on in, in this decade? Um, I think it is possible. Um, I'm a little more conservative than those guys a little bit, in which case I said, you know, if I see it go to over $30 in 2021 and then slowly climb to the $40, $50 range after that, that's going to make me pretty happy. If it does go to the triple digits, I'll be ecstatic. Um, (laughs) And what do we need for the triple digits? I think not only do we need the uh, increase in industrial demand, but we need, uh, shall we say, um, a continued decrease in the supply. And, um, but it doesn't have to be a big decrease. It just have to be enough of a decrease to, shall we say, increase the differential between supply demand. So I should have asked you that. What is the expectations for silver in 2021? I mean, I know I've seen that they estimate out of all the metals, silver, they estimate a 350% increase is necessary for all this EV and industry and such like that. Could be. What is the um, what is the expectations around you know the types of people you're discussing with? We saw a seven percent decrease last year in the amount mined. Do you anticipate another another deficit again? Yeah, it depends. And the reason I'm saying it depends is the unpredictability of the chance of finding yet a new mine and bringing a mine into production. Uh, For instance, there's two silver companies out there that are moving forward to a production decision in uh, in, uh, Mexico. Silvercrest is one of them. And, um, you know, that's a a big um, uh, positive with respect to uh, how much silver are they going to bring into the market? that is extra could that offset some of the declines that's a possibility we don't know and these are unknown factors what happens if uh, suddenly silver one finds this great silver assets and goes into production you know that might be two or three years down the road but that's going to add to the supply side of the supply demand right thing and these are the unpredictable points so if everything was static i would say yes we're going to see continues decrease i mean the silver production on an annual basis is roughly 10 times that of the ounces of gold. So you're producing somewhere around 850 to 900 million ounces of silver a year, and the projected uses are about 1 trillion ounces per year. So um, that's called a deficit, right? And if that carries on, then we're going to see increased pressures upwards on the price of silver, particularly in uh, transition to a green economy. And uh, unless a big new deposit comes on to offset that, then you never know. Okay, good deal. All right. So let me ask you last question for someone listening, right? That says, all right, you know, I, I get the precious metals thesis. I'm buying my I'm buying my silver stocks. I got that covered. But, you know, tell me, Greg, you know, big successful guy hanging around all these other big successful guys. What do I do? You know, there's, um, there's a fear of inflation, there's job losses. What would you advise someone listening to this, especially someone who's maybe in their twenties, thirties, early forties, maybe they had a rough go last year. What would be your advice or your advice to yourself in, in the world right now? Um, you know, from a, from a overall perspective. 
Well, there's a lot of smart people out there with respect to giving financial advice. And I don't purport necessarily to be a financial advisor, right? It's just the imagination. But I do think you want a portion of your portfolio in hard assets. Those hard assets, I think, um, silver and gold are excellent ones. I think silver is a better uh, bet with respect to uh, percentage increase in value, uh, at least over the next uh, five or 10 years over gold, a lot more room to move in the price of silver plus that industrial application, you know, but you don't want to put everything you own into that, just like you don't want to put everything you own into game, uh, uh, game stocks or whatever it is, you know, you want to put a portion of it in there. So be prudent, but get a portion in those hard assets because hard assets always come back. And just as an analogy, let's look at Mr. Warren Buffett when he was uh, back in the year 1999, 2000, he said, I don't invest in a lot of these tech companies that I don't understand. I want real companies that actually produce something, a hard asset. And, um, 2000, he proved pretty right on the mark when the entire tech community collapsed, all those dot-com companies disappeared, and only a few crawled out of the ashes called Apple, Amazon, Google, etc. But most of them just disappeared, and all those billions of dollars were lost. Well, they weren't lost. They just went elsewhere. (laughs) All right. Well, I'm with you. I'm I'm excited about silver. I'm excited about the prospects, the industrial use. So um, to to conclude here, uh, tell us again, Silver One Resources, traded where? Where can we we check it out and where can we find more? Yeah. Okay. So we trade on the uh, Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol SVE, and uh, we trade on the OT. ECQX uh, out of New York under SLVRF. So you can look us up on either of those exchanges, or you can just Google www.silverone.com and you can go to our website and get a lot of information from that. All right, Greg. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we're going to have Greg back on again as we start to get the silver market moving. Hopefully, we pass that $30 into 40 and 50 here pretty soon. And as we start to see, hopefully, a little bit more of a squeeze on the supply, <laughs> we'll have some insiders like Greg back on to discuss what he's seeing behind the scenes in the market. So if you have questions that I did not address, either particularly about Silver One Resources and the related Uh, silver stock equities or the overall silver market, please leave them in the comments right there down below. And when, when, when Greg comes back on next time, I'll go back through and source some of the most relevant questions either pertaining to silver one or the overall silver market. So be sure to leave those down below with your silver price predictions for 2021. Greg said he's expecting a thousand dollars silver in 2021. So we'll hear yours. I'm just messing with you. Jake, I know I'm old, but I'm not that old that I forgot what I said. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So for everyone listening, please make sure you hit the like button on the right side, the left side. Let's send this out to more people. Of course, if you haven't yet, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification as well. And uh, thanks for coming on, Greg.